On today's episode of Locked On Canucks, Vancouver interviewed the potential second overall pick in the NHL draft. How do the Canucks build a great on-ice performance? And who are some cheap free agents Vancouver could attract come July? It's Locked On Canucks. It's Friday, and it starts now. Your Locked On Canucks, your daily podcast on the Vancouver Canucks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today, Friday, June the 3rd episode of Locked On Canucks. I'm, of course, your host, Justin Pooney. You can find me at underscore process sports on Twitter. I want to thank you for making Locked On Canucks your first listen of the day. Of course, we are free and available wherever you get your podcast services. Guys, like I mentioned, it's Friday. It's, you know, exciting weekends around the corner. Weather is becoming nicer. Um, you know, I'm excited for that. But first, we have to get you locked in on all things Vancouver Canucks. And in this first segment, we sent an interesting news break today that the Canucks, um, you know, talked to Slavkovsky, Yurod Slavkovsky, the projected second overall pick in this draft in Montreal upcoming. He, of course, is ranked the number one skater from Europe by NHL Central Scouting. And, you know, he was on with certain other NHL podcasts, and he was asked um, about teams that he could – he's a winger, that he could potentially play center. And he said that Vancouver had asked him if he could play center. Now, you might be thinking – why are the Canucks at 15 intriguing with the potential second overall pick? Well, I think potentially they're doing their due diligence. They're just asking. They're just seeing now. Could be poten- We've heard stories about this in sports history before. You know, potential pros- uh, top you know five prospects in a draft talking to teams outside the top 10 or the top five. Uh, just the other teams doing their due diligence just in case they drop in case a trade can pull up and all of that stuff. But it is also very interesting that there is the New Jersey Devils who reports have indicated they are open to trading this number two overall pick. And the Canucks, of course, have a very interesting trade piece to potentially move in one JT Miller. So it got me thinking, do you trade JT Miller for the second overall pick in the NHL draft straight up? And you can take Slavkovsky at number two. Now, I think Slavkovsky is a very good player. He's not, but I think in this draft, it's kind of Shane Wright and kind of the rest kind of trickles down. So it's going to be very interesting to see how it plays out. But the way I see this going, it would have to be Miller plus something for the second overall pick. I don't think the second overall pick warrants enough to trade a hundred point man, a guy who's been your best player for the last three years, just for a prospect. Now Slavkovsky, of course, is six, four, a big guy. Um, I don't think get your hopes up that you think he's going to see him in a Canucks uniform anytime soon, because first of all, New Jersey's going to have to want to take JT. Now, of course they offered Dougie had, they gave Dougie Hamilton that big deal. They of course have uh, Jack Hughes. You know, they had PK Subban. They have Nico. He's you know, they have some nice pieces, but it's still New Jersey. It's still the dumpster fire, the ass of the NHL, in my personal opinion. Like, the, gone are the days of Scott Stevens, Scott Niedermeyer, Martin Brodeur, Lou Lamorello. That franchise is in big trouble. So, yeah, they could sign JT. They could trade for JT Miller and, you know, give him a boatload of money and try to run it like that. But I don't think Tom Fitzgerald is going to want to invest that much ask that asset of a number two overall pick plus whatever, you know, what a prospect or whatever, which I think what the asking price should definitely be. I don't, the way I see prospects in the NHL, you know what JT Miller is. He's a given. He's going to get you, you know, 65 to maybe not 90 points, but 65 to 80 points in a season. He's going to play on your first unit power play. He can kill penalties, win faceoffs. He's a leader. He has all the intangibles. Stuff like that doesn't come off the tree. If you're going to trade that for a, a top five prospect who, you know, looks like he will be, you know, be a solid NHL player, but I don't see Slav, uh, Slavkovsky being a 
a surefire number one with a bullet guy the Canucks can go after. Um, I don't see that taking place. Now, yesterday I talked about who the Canucks, you know, what the trade, sorry, what the contract would be for JT Miller if they wanted to sign him. Well, if they were to trade JT Miller, first of all, I think it would be to the Eastern Conference. It wouldn't be, they wouldn't trade him to the West. But it would also be to a team that would have to, you would think, um, you know, be willing to sign him to a new deal. Now, is Jersey going to be willing to sign him to a new deal? They could potentially be. But I think he's worth more than the second overall pick. I think he's worth more than just giving up for a grade A prospect. This is not like the Bo Horvat for Corey Schneider thing. Look, Corey Schneider had a nice couple of seasons where he put in a platoon with Roberto Luongo. He was never that one day for an extended period of time, right? We know what JT Miller is. He's a proven commodity, which means his value is much higher. He's coming off a 100-point season. So you don't just give away just for a straight-up pick. You want a pick or at least multiple picks. But like I said before, that's not the route that I think the Canucks want to go down. The Canucks want to go down the route of making the playoffs next year contending i don't see them just moving jt miller for a guy who could step into the lineup but is not going to make an immediate dividend because we can't guarantee that an 18 year old kid's going to come into the league and you know be on fire there are those few special ones that are able to but not every player can do that so if the canucks trade jt miller you're gonna have to get young proven assets or guys that can or yeah, young proven assets that are can step into the lineup right away that will give you cap relief, but also, you know, don't really hinder your progression of your team. So that's my take on the whole JT Miller situation with the trade and also the Canucks talking to um <clears throat> that's my take on the Canucks talking about uh Slavkovsky. Um asking to play center, seeing I think they're just doing their due diligence. I don't seeing potentially there could be a trade, but I don't see anything pursuing any forward about that. So that is that. I think don't read too much stock into it. It's just Jim Rutherford, Patrick Levine, the scouting department doing their due diligence. Um, I don't see a Miller trade going down to New Jersey for the second overall pick. That would be a horrible deal. The Canucks need to do the second overall pick plus more for JT Miller because he's a proven commodity. Prospects are not proven commodities. So that's my take on that. That is that. Coming up after this break, I'm going to talk to you guys about how to build a team in the current NHL to win, specifically about the Vancouver Canucks because they have a very big offseason, the restructuring, all that. So how would the Canucks build a team that A, can be sustainably good and win in the playoffs? So stick around for that. But first, I want to talk to you guys about betonline.net. Of course, betonline.net is your number one source for all your betting stats and sports info. Find all the latest sports developments, news, and odds, including this just meant basketball championship matchup the nhl conference finals major league baseball and of course the latest fighting news from mma and ufc to boxing bet online is your continued source for all your sporting wagering information including live bets esports and more head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action bet online where the game starts so you've been watching the playoffs you've been analyzing them and studying them like I have, or you just watch it for fun, you can all agree, or we can all agree, that these NHL playoffs have been absolutely electric off the charts. Uh, probably the best we've seen in a very long time. Um, as I said before, uh, lately I was always more of an NFL, uh, sorry, NBA playoff guy, but this year the NBA playoffs have been kind of so-so. Game one of the finals was great, but this year's NHL playoffs have been stellar. You've seen the game and the speed and the skill at the highest level it's ever been in a very long time. And that is how the game has now evolved to. This is not like the 80s where, you know, it was free-flowing and all that, but the goalies were not very good. The defense was not very good. And you could still, there's fighting and brawls galore. It's not like the 90s and the early 2000s where it was the dead puck era where I could hold on to you, bear hug you, and drag you down to the ice. I could do all the hooking, holding, slashing. There was a red line, two line pass, all of that stuff, right? This game now, we and it didn't. They implemented the rules after the lockup, but it took time for the game to evolve. Like anything in life, anything in life, it takes time for things to evolve to the the new stages, the new developments, the new 
uh, of the new, you know, additions, the new rules, right? So you look at it, you know, the NFL for years was always a running back centered league, run the ball, run the ball, run the ball, set up the pass. Now, of course, the NFL has transitioned into a pass first league. That's why you're seeing wide receivers now make $30 million a year. Same thing in the NHL. You're seeing now guys come into the league who, you know, pan out to be just, you know, third, fourth liners, but they still have skill. You know, they could put up, they put the puck in the back of the net in, the, in junior or, you know, the minors. You know, everybody that comes into the league now can skate, can handle the puck, and can, you know, has a certain amount of skill level. One of the guys that are like just the Darian Hatchers or whoever that was just a big body that could just block people and had no skill whatsoever. I'm not saying Darren Hatcher didn't have skill. He just was one of the prime examples of the dead puck era. But, you know, everybody can shoot the puck now. Everybody can pass. Everybody, and you're seeing now every just the evolution of the game to the highest form. You're watching, you know, the, the Edmonton, Colorado series. Edmonton is a very fast team. But Colorado is an octane faster. Kale McCarr, Nathan McKinnon. Miko ran. You're just seeing these skill and the and the speed of these guys play. Of course, we all marvel at Connor McDavid's speed, and that is how I feel you have to win. You look at you know the Rangers, Tampa. It's about skill, speed. Yes, you have guys that you know can get into the dirty areas and win the pucks, but you know it's predicated on speed and skill. When you look at the Canucks, they're not a fast team. They are not a fast team. When you think about their players. Not speed. Yes, Quinn Hughes, great skater. You don't see guys that can turn the Jets on and get it on the forecheck. And when you look at guys like you know Bo Horvath, Brock Besser, you know Bo, you know some he's got some giddy up to him, but he's a bigger body and he's gonna play the game. Brock Besser, his skating is not his best part. That was game. You know, um, Tyler Myers, not the best thing. Oliver Ekman Larson's older, his skating is not there. When you look at how the NHL is. You look at the Tampas, of course, Victor Hedman, a big, big body, but he is absolutely unbelievable with his mobility. He can take the puck from the behind his net, skate up the ice, break it out himself, or give you that one perfect pass up the ice. That is how you build a team, in my personal opinion. If I was a general manager of an NHL team, how will I build my team? Well, first, you got to have the spine down the middle. So I need a goalie who I can know can give me, you know, 55 to 60 games a year that will be solid. Then I need I need a defense that is mobile, that can move the puck up the ice and get it to forward to A, have the ability to get in on the four. Carolina. Carolina has a great four check. They get the puck in deep. They get on your defense. They cause turnovers. They get the puck in the offensive end and they can cycle. They can grind you down and they can score. Now, of course, they come, they're often, they couldn't play well on the road and they lost in game seven. But I, Carolina has been an excellent team over the last couple of years. The Rangers, how did they rebuild their team? Younger, faster. Chris Kreider getting in on the forecheck. Of course, Artemi Panarin is not going to get on the forecheck, but he's got a set of hands. He's, he's a top elite player. Tampa, Kucherov, Kalorn. Have you ever watched Alex Kalorn play? Alex Kalorn, in my opinion, is a very underrated player. The amount of times I watch Alex Kalorn get in on the forecheck, cause a turnover, and start the cycle for Tampa. Keep that maintained puck possession in the other end. That is unbelievable. Of course, McDavid drives our elite, but guys like Kyler Yamamoto, Nugent Hawkins, Zach Hyman. I know Zach Hyman played on the Leafs, and you know I have the whole stigma against it. But Zach Hyman, when he's with the Oilers, does the gritty stuff very well. He gets the puck in deep. He gets it on the forecheck, can grind down, and that is how you win. You need guys that can get it on the forecheck, grind in the corners, get the puck out to your offensive players in open positions so they can score. But you also need defense that is a defense that is mobile, and the Canucks don't have that currently as constructed. So again, I think the Canucks focus should be now is remember when they were successful. What were the puck possession team? Then the whole mindset went in. Oh, this team got beat up by Boston. This team got beat up, and this team needs to become tougher. Of course, you need guys that are ability to have that sandpaper, but. You don't need your traditional enforcers anymore. Your gritty grinders. You know, as as much as Calgary floundered, that third line of Backlin, Coleman, uh, Mangiapane, that is a really good third line because they can all sc- 
play offensively. They can all play defensively. They can play in the transition game. They can play in the corners. That is what you need. The Canucks don't have that right now, in my personal opinion. Guys that can have sustained shifts in the offensive end. Puck possession is key in the NHL now. If you want to be a successful team, you have to have speed. You have to be able to possess the puck. And you have to have defensemen that can move the puck. Right? Well, I think the Canucks have some really good offensive pieces and some superstar potential pieces. The rest of the roster, especially on the back end, cannot get the puck up properly to those forwards. The speed on their up, up front is not where it needs to be. Do I think they have the ability to get younger? But you have to cut, get rid of guys like Tanner Pearson, Dickinson, all these guys. You need to get younger players that have the ability to have fresh legs and are not willing to go in the corners, play that grindy game, that grinding game, and get the pucks up. That's that's how I would build my team. If I'm going to build a team, I'm going to build my team based off puck possession, based off speed, and the ability to go in the corners and grind out other teams' defensives, tire them out. That is how you win in this game. And also, we need good goaltending, which the Canucks have already. So that is kind of how I would build a team if I was you know, a general manager of the NHL. Focus on puck possession, mobility, and grinders. Because in the playoffs, you need those samples. Now, I'm not talking your traditional enforcers, the grinders that get in the corners, play that 200-foot game, and can you know get on another four check. That is how I would play this game. So um, that is that with the Canucks. And after this break, I'm going to explain some forwards that potentially could come in this offseason to help play that brand of hockey. Welcome back. We also have an important favor to ask you. We've put together a survey so you can... Oh, shit. Welcome back to Locked on Canucks. We have an important favor to ask you. We've put together a survey so we can learn more about listeners like you and make your favorite Locked on Podcast even better. This is your opportunity to tell us what you like and don't like about Locked on Podcast. Go to LockedOnPodcast.com slash survey right now to get started. It won't take very long and everyone that completes the survey can qualify for a chance to win one of 10 $100 Ticketmaster gift cards. To take your audience survey, go to LockedOnPodcast.com slash survey. Thank you for your help. So, like I just went said, how I would build a team. Now I have some forwards that potentially could come into the Canucks this offseason um, and fit that style. So, number one, again, going back to the well of the Leafs, we had Travis Dermott, we, the, the Canucks just brought in. Uh, Ilya Labushkin, right-handed defenseman from the of course, the Coyotes and the Maple Leafs, uh, he scored two goals, 13 assists, uh, which are both career highs. But the reason why I would bring in Labushkin is um, he's physical. He had, a, had 187 hits last year, which is 30-50 in the NHL. And then he had 94 uh, hits with the Coyotes and then 93 uh, with the Leafs, right? Um, he's the type of guy who he's not going to pop off or make the flashy play, but he's going to make um, the right play the right play, nothing flash. He's just going to make the smart, quiet play, which for what his position is, a 6'7 defenseman is exactly what you need. You do not need your 6'7 defenseman making flashy, splashy plays. You need your 6'7 defenseman being st- solid, stable, and when you don't notice him, that is what you want. So um, I think Ilya Labush could potentially be um, a very good fit. He's coming off a contract, one-year deal where he had made 1.35. You could probably get him for the same Probably won't offer more than a two-year deal. Um, so I would definitely do that. Another right-handed defenseman I am looking at because the Canucks need right-handed defensemen is the former guy himself, Troy from Richmond, Troy Stetcher. Of course, he played his first four years in Vancouver. He still is a fan favorite. He split this year between Detroit and L.A. He only played 29 games. Uh, he had four. He's in the four playoff games against Edmonton. He scored twice and had two assists. Um the one thing, Stature, of course, he's not uberly talented. He's not the biggest guy. But he has the ability to move the puck up the Yes, He's a very good passer. He can get what I just said. We need puck-moving defense that can move the puck up and put, press the play forward, which the Stature can do. So Troy Stature can move the puck up the ice with his passing ability. Make that first and get the puck in deep. And I love that about him. Again, he's probably going to be what a bottom bottom pairing defenseman. He's not going to be, you know, a top four guy. He'll probably be a bottom six guy. And if the price is right, I don't see what's the what's the hurt in bringing back Troy Stetcher at all. Um, another uh, piece could potentially be. Now we're going to go up to the forwards. Another guy from LA is Andre Athanasiu. 
Um, again, he plays a center, but can also play on the wing. Um, he scored. He was a former thirty goal scorer in Detroit, um, and you know he had a deep, he kind of injury uh, riddled year this year with LA. Eleven goals, six assists. Again, but he plays that game, that type of game where he can get in the corners, get on the four check, play that kind of heavy sandpaper game. Is that bottom type of bottom six type of guy, um, and he could be depth. He has the ability to score. He can possess the puck, but he's also going to can penalty kill, can play on their bottom six. And I think it'll be a welcome addition. If I would rather have Andre Andreas Athens senior than Jason Dickinson as my third line center or my fourth line center, right? A guy that has scoring prowess, a guy that can, you know, play that that grindy game, that dirty game in the corners. I, like that, I, I would take that. Another guy is Curtis Lazar. Curtis Lazar is a BC native. Again, a very effective penalty killer. Um, coming from Boston, he was, of course, was a top first overall pick. Um, he, you know, scored eight goals and matched eight assists last year. You know, he's a defensive center, but again, he's got some speed. You know, he's got some wheels to him. He can, you know, play that game in the corners, play that grinding game. So I think that you see my trend here. The guys that are, these are just the guys on the cheap, right? These guys are all on the cheap. But if the Canucks can get a guy like that on the cheap, on the low, that can come in and play that style of game, that can be very effective for them because that's going to help them out. Speed, puck possession, puck moving, right? Guys that can play in the corners. That is what you need to win. I just stated that right now. And these four guys right now can help the Canucks in that area. So if I'm Jim Rutherford, Patrick Alvin, I'm looking at those four guys. And if I get them on a one to two year deal for a pretty minimal cost, I would absolutely try to make that. You've got to, we know the Canucks have, you know, the top end talent. It's the bottom half of the roster that needs to, you know, pick the slack up, right? So a guys like Curtis Lazar, Athens, Stetcher, you know, Labushkin, those four guys right there. Now, if they add two of those guys, I think this team is in a better position than they are before because those guys can play the modern NHL game, right? Now, again, Injuries and all that come into a factor, but on this on the surface level, those type of those type of people you would acquire are very very important. I think that that would be something I would look at. So that is all for today, guys. It's Friday. Hope you guys have a good weekend. Uh, come Monday, we're gonna have some special stuff I have planned. Uh, first full week of you know June, um, so I have some fun stuff lined up starting next week that I'm not gonna. Uh, tell you guys, yeah, I'm going to keep it a secret. So tune in on Monday. There's going to be some fun uh, new content coming out on Monday. Um, so and I want to thank you for making Locked On Canucks your first listen of the day. For your second listen of the day, Locked On NHL. Locked On NHL covers playoffs like no other. Hear the latest news and opinions from local experts every Monday through Friday. It's free and available wherever you get your podcast services. Guys, take care. Stay safe.